retirement plans, pensions, and annuities, and we're looking here at what it is that needs to be included in income. And the good news is, is we have a little bit of control over what distributions are going to be included or not included in income based on how it is that we set up the individual plan, how we have our pension in these plans set up. So we start by looking at the taxability of distributions, just kind of as an overall starting point here. Distributions that are distributions of growth or gains, not the basis in the investment, are generally included in income. Now, distributions of basis, those non-deductible contributions that were made, are a tax-free return of principal and not included in income. And a loss may arise if the entire account is withdrawn and a taxpayer receives less than their cost basis in that account. Okay, you invested $100,000 or contributed $100,000 in total, and you only get back $75,000. Well, that's a loss. You received back less than it is that you paid into it, than you made in that investment. So for qualified retirement plans, for a 401k, a 403b, and other certain pension plans, and individual retirement arrangements, the basis equals the amount of after-tax or non-deductible contributions that are remaining within the plan. Okay, so deductible contributions that were made do not create basis. Okay, so plan contribution that you made that was deductible when the contribution was made does not create basis. And so since distributions from a qualified plan, therefore, are usually taxable, because most recipients have no cost basis because those contributions they made, those contributions that they've been making, are not going to be qualified. They're deductible contributions that were being made, and so no basis is created. They were making, when they made those contributions, they were deductible and not included in income at that time of that contribution. Now, if the taxpayer has a basis, the pro rata portion of each withdrawal that represents basis is not going to be taxed, okay, if there is a basis to that. Now, withdrawals other than required distributions can maintain a tax-deferred treatment if they're transferred into another qualified plan or IRA within 60 days, and this is what is com commonly called a rollover, okay? Any amount that's withdrawn and not rolled over within this 60-day time period is then subject to tax. Now, look very briefly here at an annuity. This is a, an annuity that's set up in a qualified plan or IRA will receive the same tax treatment afforded the plan as a whole. And so if the annuity is a non-qualified annuity funded with after-tax dollars, individuals do not receive a tax deduction for the investment. So the initial basis is the total of all of those contributions to the policy. And then the periodic payments are allocated to income or basis based on kind of the proportion of all of that. Now, in addition to that, we'll go, actually, we'll go ahead and look at an example here. George spends $100,000 for an immediate annuity. The insurance company will pay George $500 each month, each month for the next 20 years. The tax-free portion of each payment is $416.67, and that's just a proportion, okay? They're getting $500 each month for the next 20 years, which is going to be $120,000. And so of that $500, the tax-free portion is 416 because that's what George paid. George paid 100. Okay, that's $416.67 a month. So the tax-free portion of that $500 is $416.67, which means the difference between that and $500, $83.33 or whatever it is, that's going to be taxable, okay? That's going to be that growth. That's going to be that gain. Now, the big thing that we have here in terms of all of these retirement plans are distributions and trying to make certain that the distributions don't have as many tax or have as few taxes as possible on it. And so what we need to do is make certain that we're making qualified distributions because withdrawals other than qualified distributions may be subject to a 10% additional tax on the distribution. Okay? So if it's not a qualified distribution, not only do we pay our income taxes, but there's another 10% tax that we need to pay on that. And so this tax applies to the amount received that the person, the taxpayer, needs to include in income. So the key thing here is what are these qualified distributions? So a qualified distribution is a payment that meets one of these criteria. 
It's made on or after the date the person reaches the age of 59 and a half. Okay, so once you get to 59 and a half, you're good. It's made because the taxpayer is disabled. That's a qualified distribution. It's made as part of a series of substantially equal periodic payments. It's made to a beneficiary or to the taxpayer's estate after death. That's a qualified distribution. Used to purchase the taxpayer's first home up to a $10,000 lifetime limit. Or used to pay expenses for the birth or adoption of a child up to $5,000. So those are the qualified distributions that don't have the additional 10% tax on it. If your distribution doesn't meet one of these criteria, there's going to be an additional 10% tax in addition to the tax that you owe on that distribution. Now, in addition to our qualified distributions, or hopefully all of our qualified distributions, there are also mandatory distributions that are required. So an owner of an IRA, including SEPs and simple IRAs, must begin mandatory what are called required minimum distributions from their account for each year starting with the year the taxpayer reaches the age 72 or 70 and a half if they turn 70 and a half prior to January 1st, 2020. Okay, so when we get to this age, 72 or 70 and a half, we need to start making these required minimum distributions. Now, the calculation of the required minimum distribution includes a lot of things. We're not going to have to do that. We don't need to worry about that. But we just need to know that these required minimum distributions need to be made. The reason these required minimum distribution rules exist is it prevents somebody from leaving money in retirement accounts indefinitely. Okay? Deferred your taxes until you retired. The government wants its tax money, and so there's going to be these required minimum distributions to make certain that you're pulling some of your money, at least, out of this retirement account. The failure to take a required minimum distribution can result in a penalty equal to 50% of the required distribution amount. And so, clearly, that's the incentive, then, to do that. We also may have distributions due to death. The surviving spouse can elect to treat an inherited IRA or qualified retirement plan as their own by rolling the account into their name. All other beneficiaries generally need to withdraw the entire balance of that retirement account within 10 years or another specified time period. And again, that specified time period depends on the age of the person who received it, the age of the beneficiary, the type of beneficiary, whether it's an individual, a trust, or a state. But there's different requirements for different recipients there. And finally, we also have Roth IRAs. Roth IRAs, mandatory distributions, are not required when attaining age 72. Okay? And so that required minimum distribution doesn't exist for a Roth IRA. And certain qualified distributions may be tax-free. Qualified distribution meets, if it, it's a qualified distribution if it meets both of these requirements. First, it's made after the five year period beginning with the first year a contribution was made, and it meets one of these criteria made on or after the date the taxpayer reaches age 59 and a half, made because the taxpayer is disabled, made to a beneficiary to the estate after death, used to purchase the taxpayer's first home, up to $10,000 and used to pay expenses for the birth or adoption of a child. These are the same requirements that we had for a regular IRA, but we have the additional one for the Roth IRA. It needs to be made after the five-year period beginning with the first year a contribution was made. So when we're talking about our retirement distributions, it is very possible that we're not going to have to pay taxes on it. It depends on how the contributions were made to that plan and whether or not they were deductible or not at the time. But the things that we need to take away from this, we need to make certain that we understand qualified distributions. And if we don't make a qualified distribution, there's that 10% additional tax, what those requirements are for something to be a qualified distribution. And we also need to remember that we have these required minimum distributions where when we get to the age of 72 or 70 and a half, we need to start making some distributions out of the account. We are not allowed just to let it be in that account growing on without taxes indefinitely. So we've got those qualified distributions and those required minimum distributions, but this is all part of what determining what's included in our taxable income for these retirement, these pension plans that we may have.